In the 1880s, the small central Massachusetts village of North Brookfield was a thriving community. The village centered around the firm of E. and A. H. Batchelor. Once the largest boot manufacturer in the world, it was now stumbling and feeling pressure from the labor movement. However, the Batchelor company managed to hold its ground and still employ hundreds of town folk. In its 50 years of business, small cottage industries and services sprung up around the big shop. A branch of a railroad was created to link Bachelor with the main line in East Brookfield. A hotel was built to support travelers and business folks. A newspaper, photographer, dentist, lunch counter, and millinery shop all called Main Street home. It was into this world that a young George M. Cohan spent some of his most formative years. As a member of the four Cohans, George had spent most of his life traveling the country from vaudeville theater to vaudeville theater. The life of a traveling performer was hard, and especially hard on a family of four. Although born in Providence, Rhode Island, he spent little time there. The family would travel for 40 weeks out of the year. In December of 1878, at the age of six months, George made his first visit to North Brookfield. He would return year after year until about the age of 12, with the last visit of his youth occurring in 1895 at the age of 17. His childhood in town was, by his own accounts, filled with fantastic experiences. Baseball was his favorite sport, and he was part of a group of ball players called the Coughlin Disturbers. Cohan served as captain, manager, and coach. Char Coughlin ran a little shop on Church Street that served as a base for the nine boys. The boys were more than just a makeshift ball team. One famous incident had the Disturbers traveling to Colebrook for a ball game. The nine boys, with the help of Billy Bemis's team of horses, made their way to the game. They handily won the game and decided to have a victory dinner in Colebrook before making their way back to North Brookfield. As the boys sat around the table, the group demanded that little George show them how New Yorkers dance. The food was swept off the table. George jumped up and started hoofing away. The owner ran out, scolding Cohan. Then the melee began. A bread roll was thrown, then another, and another, and then finally, a potato. The owner ran for the constable, and the boys ran for their carriage back home. Several days later, the North Brookfield Journal wrote a gossip piece scolding the New Yorker for his wild behavior. George didn't approve, and he rode his bicycle through the front doors of the North Brookfield Journal and told the newsman just how he felt. George was ten years old. It wasn't only baseball and mischief, Little George wrote and produced his own plays in the barn of his grandmother's house on Bell Street. He acted as playwright, composer, and actor. All roles he would grow to excel at as an adult. George was a natural performer. By the age of nine, he played the violin for an audience in Haverstraw, New York. This was a skill he learned from John Doyle of North Brookfield's own Doyle's Orchestra. Every year, as their summer vacation would come to an end, the four Cohans would give a grand farewell to the residents of North Brookfield. They would help finance their upcoming tour by mounting a show on the stage of the townhouse. George remembered these shows so fondly that he would later donate a proscenium arch, a set of versatile scenery, and a painted backdrop to the townhouse and to the residents of the town, all of which currently sit in disrepair. The Coughlin Disturbers became a group of friends that would make lifelong connections. One of George's closest friends, Dennis Cap O'Brien, was a teammate and confidant. Cohan referred to O'Brien as one of the smartest kids he knew, and O'Brien proved him right. Attending Brown University and Georgetown School of Law, the former Coughlin Disturber opened a law office in Providence, Rhode Island. O'Brien had been in the business only a few years when his old friend George M. stopped by. 
O'Brien explained that he wasn't getting along with his partner, and Cohen made him an offer that would change his life. Cap, you come down to New York and I'll let you put the biggest picture of me in your lobby that you want. You can let the whole world know that you represent George M. Cohan. O'Brien agreed, and in 1906 moved his offices to New York City. He took his nephew, Arthur Driscoll, in as a partner, and later another North Brookfield boy, Edward Rafferty. The firm of these three North Brookfield boys became one of the most powerful law firms in the entertainment industry. O'Brien, Driscoll, and Rafferty represented Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Arthur Godfrey, Walter Winchell, Irving Berlin, Jack Dempsey, and, of course, George M. Cohan. The firm was instrumental in the organization of United Artists, and former North Brookfield residents Ed Rafferty served as its president from 1941 to 1947. Not only had Rafferty served as president of United Artists, he also handled the incorporation of the Pepsi-Cola Corporation. All of this from the former boys of the Coughlin Disturbers. Cohan took some others with him as well. William Carey Duncan made a living writing plays that were produced by the Cohan and Harris Company. Among his successes, he wrote The Royal Vagabond and the sequel to No No Nanette, entitled Yes Yes Yvette. He is also responsible for using North Brookfield as the setting for two of his Broadway shows. Duncan remained a resident of North Brookfield until his death in 1945. In 1907, Cohan had left the world of vaudeville for writing, producing, and sometimes starring in legitimate Broadway shows. Fifty Miles from Boston was another attempt to break free of what he considered the drudgery of vaudeville. He set the show in North Brookfield and includes the names that were familiar to everyone. Names like Brainerd and Woodis, and even had a set built to resemble the general store located in town. Fifty Miles from Boston ran a standard run on Broadway with a total of 40 performances. However, as Cohan's shows gained in popularity, it was revived several years later and toured the country extensively. For I'm just as proud of my name, you see, as an emperor, czar, or a king could be. Who is the man, helps the man every time he can, Harrigan, that's me. The critics praised the song Small Town Gal. But the tune that stood the test of time was Harrigan, a song that became a part of American popular culture. Over the years, the song has been recorded by hundreds of artists and has been heard on radio shows, movies, and television shows. Cohan went on to become the man who owned Broadway and became one of the most honored American entertainers. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for the songs Over There and You're a Grand Old Flag, and he was personally involved in over 50 Broadway plays and published 1,500 songs. In October of 1934, only eight years from the end of his life, Cohan returned to North Brookfield to bring one last show to the folks of town. Having visited town in July of that year to preside over the Connie Mack Day celebrations, he felt he could give the town a thank you for all the grand memories. He was currently on tour with Eugene O'Neill's Ah Wilderness, and mounted a scaled-back production in the town hall. Sets were borrowed from the local women's club, as the touring sets were too large to fit on the townhouse's stage, and the curtain, which Cohan had donated years previous, was repainted for the occasion. For this one-night engagement, George requested that the tickets be given to North Brookfield residents only. The hall quickly filled to its 400-person capacity, and a crowd of 3,500 people gathered outside to hear the performance on loudspeakers. It was a fitting farewell to a man who had called this little piece of Massachusetts his home. Is the name that the shame never has been connected with Harrigan? That's me. Shame never has been connected with Harrigan. That's me.